Ah, yeah. We all have to rely on our marine diesel auxiliary engine every now and then. But do we understand and treat it correctly? We need it so we can get in and out of port. We also need it when the wind dies. We also need it when we can't keep up with the current. There's lots of times when we actually need it. I suppose it's just our lives and our busy schedules. Because even boats like this, which were never designed for a marine diesel engine, end up with marine diesel engines, just because life's simpler that way. Well, as you know, they come in all shapes and sizes. Power horsepower starts, I think, around somewhere about five or six in a marine diesel engine and goes, well, it goes limitless. But in small yachts, I should imagine up to about 30 horsepower is quite a lot. When they first started adding power to sailing boats as auxiliary engines, they used the rule of thumb of one ton per one horsepower. That seems to have gone out the windows these days. You can stick as much power as you want to in your boat, but it has got a governing factor, a self-governing factor. It's the waterline length, and it stops your boat at a hull speed, so you don't need a massive engine, really. What you do need is a propeller, a propeller that's absolutely matched to that engine and that hull speed. And if you've got those three things, the hull, the engine and the propeller, all working together, then your boat will drive itself efficiently. I personally say two to three horsepowers per tonne is more than enough unless you've got tons of windage, in which case you could probably add one more horsepower, but anything more than that is just overkill. Okay, so what does it mean when I say you've got to have the three items matched together? How do you match an engine with a hull? Well, you don't. You just pick an engine you want to go with a hull. You already have the boat, I presume, and you want to put a motor in it. You buy the motor you can afford. But then you've got to match the motor to the hull, and you do that with the propeller. Most propeller manufacturers will have a calculation system set up when you give them the boat horsepower and the boat waterline length and the boat weight. They will work out the prop you need, the pitch you need and so on. So what happens if you get it wrong? Well, you're going to be overpropped or underpropped. What does that mean? Overpropped is normally when your boat achieves its hull speed quite quickly in calm conditions but can't push its way through a bumpy sea without getting its nose knocked off all the time and stalling. It will struggle to make full RPM. It will also increase the soot output of your exhaust and your engine temperature will be a little bit higher. This is all due to the fact that you're keeping the engine under more load than it's required. It will also have difficulty stopping the boat while manoeuvring in marinas and it will have increased prop walk. When she's underpropped, you find that the engine revs are really high, but you don't manage to get to hull speed. Everyone overtakes you, and it takes you forever to get anywhere under motor. On the plus side, you'll find it a lot easier to manoeuvre in a marina, and it'll have a lot less prop walk, while giving you good power and steerage while in a chop. Using our engine correctly helps as well. In the early days of Morse controls, there was twin lever setups. One lever to select forward, neutral and reverse, and the other lever for the throttle. Of course, everything now has got single lever on it to make life easier. In order to disengage the gears, push the red button in here while pushing the lever forward, and it will free rev. On this type of single lever system, I think it's a lot more reliable without the red button. In order to switch to free revving, you get the centre shaft in the centre here and you pull it outwards. Move it into a forward or a reverse position and she's now got free revving. From free revving to go into gear, you just move it back to the neutral position there and then it will select whatever gear you put in thereafter. At the beginning of each day, starting the engine, you need to run through your checklist. You need to make sure your oil level's okay by using your dipstick. You need to check that the belts are okay visually and give them a feel not too loose. You need to make sure you've got fuel in your tank and that the fuel is switched on. You need to make sure your coolant seacock is open in line so it can cool the engine. You need to make sure that the engine battery switch is selected. You need to make sure that neutral is selected on your gear stick and a small amount of revs are put on the throttle and then we're ready to go. 
Switch the ignition on, making sure that the warning lights light up and the audible buzzer can be heard. Then press the button. The engine should come into life just above idle and everything should look normal with it. And then the first thing we need to do then is lift the revs up on it and get them up to about 1500 RPM so the engine can warm up properly. Next we need to make sure that the coolant's working and that the engine is pumping water right the way through the system. It's easy to do, just stick your head over the back where your transom is or your exhaust is and watch for water coming out. If it's not coming out, switch everything off and check everything. I've only showed you this bit of video for one reason. People who are new to boats normally treat it like a car because that's what they're used to. They keep it in, say, a stern gear all the way to the point where they want to go forward and then move the gear lever in one foul move from reverse to neutral to forward, clunk, 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 giving the drivetrain inertia no time to slow down, resulting in gearbox damage, shear pins sheared, Prop nuts loosened, propellers falling off, and not realising they were the root cause. Okay, once we've left our moorings, wherever they may be, we then get to sea. And while at sea, we have choices to make on how to treat our engine and how to look after it. So how many revs should we have on the engine? And what easy checks can we make on the engine while we're out? Well, the first I always think of as really obvious keeping an eye on your exhaust and make sure it's pumping water get used to the sound it makes when it's running right I see this more often than not it's not steam powered I'm sure I'm sure there is still steam powered boats out there but I don't think this is one which means he's got a cooling problem if there's steam coming out the back that means something's boiling and if something's boiling there is a definite problem if you find yourself with steam coming out of your exhaust, you need to make some quick checks. A lot of boats now have a visible weed hatch. I'd do a quick check on my visible weed hatch and if it's a solid type, then I'd take it apart and check it. After that, I'd be uh, swapping the impeller and if that didn't cure it, I'd be ripping the thermostat out until I could get a new one. The next thing you should be doing is listening. Yes, with your ears. If everything sounds sweet, it normally is. And if there's a racket going on, there's normally a problem. You have some idiot lights and a warning buzzer as well. And they should be adhered to. If they're on, then there's normally something that needs looking into. They're not there to be ignored. I hear some people say they like to run their engine at the sweet spot. Well, I think that's probably a good place to be, the sweet spot. But where is it? We know at lower RPM, the engine sounds quieter. So it doesn't seem like it's doing as much or working as hard so that might be tempting to use and it probably burns a lot less fuel down there so that might be another temptation I run mine quite high about 2750 but I have a reason for that 
In fact, I actually have a number of reasons for this. At 27.50, she's made a wave from the bow all the way to the stern. This is an efficient point. This is the same wave that can carry her up to hull speed. The manufacturer states that the engine max is 3,600 RPM, but goes on to say in the next breath that you should only have it there for a maximum of 10 minutes. The engine should be run in between 70 and 90% for maximum efficiency. Well, efficiency is a funny word, so let's have a look at it. I think efficiency should have good power, good fuel consumption is important, speed is another one, and clean burning. I'm sure there are other points, but I feel like these are the majors. Now, manufacturers put tons and tons of research into making your engine meet all these requirements. Well, I've got a little exercise that'll show you engine efficiency, and it won't be what you expect. Another thing that the engine manufacturer normally supplies is a power curve against a fuel curve. This is what a fuel curve looks like. These are the litres that it uses per hour, and this section here is the RPM, and where you cross-reference the grid is the average use of the fuel. But note, this is based on the engine and the hull having a matched propeller. Let's see what it looks like in reality. At 1750-ish RPM, we're making three knots through the water, and she only drinks about one litre an hour so it's quite fuel efficient at this point. But if I lift the revs up to about 2250, I find the fuel consumption goes up by another half litre. But then again, the speed's gone up. It's up to four knots now, so I'm making four knots for the price of one and a half litres. Still quite decent. If I push the revs up again to 2750, she'll climb to five plus knots. She'll be drinking around two litres an hour here though which is twice the amount of fuel we'll be using at three knots. Well, let's have a look at my fuel curve. This is my red line, the area it won't rev past. And at 1750 revs, it says I get one litre, which is about right. At 2250 revs, it says I'm going to use about 1.7 litres, but I'm better here by 0.2 of a litre. And at 2750 RPM, it says I use 2.5 litres, but I'm getting two litres there, so I'm half a litre better off. So I think the manufacturer's fuel curve is worst case scenario. Now, I've never run the engine at 3250, which would turn out to be my hull speed or max hull speed. But at an estimated five litres an hour, I think I'll give it a miss. Now, it's also worth noting that this line here, 3,250 RPM, is 90% of my engine revs, which falls in exactly on my hull speed at 6.4 knots. This means my propeller is matched perfectly to my engine and hull, which is no accident. So let's do a quick exercise. Let's say we have to motor for 15 nautical miles. Throw in some raw statistics like speed, fuel, hours taken and total fuel used. Let's add the speeds and consumptions we do know. Add in the length of time it'll take at each speed. And then we can work out the total consumption for each speed. And that's not quite what you were expecting. The results are, it doesn't really matter what speed you're travelling at how much your consumption is, because at the end of the day, the fuel used is virtually the same. Which leaves the question, what are the major advantages or disadvantages of travelling at different speeds? And it's simple, it's in black and white in front of your eyes. You can virtually half your travelling time for only a 10% increase in fuel usage. And that's got to be efficiency. And the Brucey bonus you get with all this is you virtually half your engine hours, resulting in an engine that lasts twice as long. That is definitely a win-win situation. Now, my engine is definitely overkill, and it's one big thirsty beast. So most other engines that are out there are going to perform far better than mine and be more efficient where mine's efficient. 
So I think it's fair to say the two major factors in efficiency are one, having your prop matched to your gearbox and your hull, and two, running your engine at least 70% of its RPM range, or as some may say, to the sweet spot. I would prefer to call it your cruising speed, which you should use at any given opportunity. Of course, you can't always travel along at cruising speed, like when entering marinas or canals and places like that where your speed is reduced. Well, this is okay if it's only for minutes. It's not going to make much of a difference. But if you were to run with your engine revs down for quite a period of time, say an hour, then you would build up soot in your exhaust port, and this can be quite dangerous if built up over time. In fact, I'd say running your engine at a low RPM for a period of time is probably the worst thing you can do for your motor. So if you do find yourself in a situation where you've had to use low RPM for a period of time, you can do something about it. You can either get to an area of water that you can open your boat up for a bit, or when you actually get to your mooring, you select neutral and bang some revs on and leave it revving its nuts off for 10 minutes or so and hopefully that will clean your exhaust port out and keep everything the way it should be. If you remember at the beginning, I was going to show you engine efficiency, power, fuel economy, speed, environmentally clean. Well, power, I've shown you at what point to run your engine, 70 to 90% of its rev range, so that's done. I've shown you about fuel curves and how they work, so fuel economy is sorted. I've also shown and explained what cruising speed is, so that's sorted. And as for environmentally clean, I've shown you and told you about what causes soot in the exhaust system. And I've shown you that using your cruising speed correctly halves your time, more or less, that you're actually spent with your engine hours running. Well, half the time with the engine hours running has got to be good for the environment. So we can tick that off as well. So I think I've shown quite clearly engine efficiency.